Good morning, friends. This is Steve. I'm not in southern Illinois today. Uh, actually, over in Missouri, taking a break. COVID has started to die down in southern Illinois. My, there are ICU beds, and my doctors are no longer quite as stressed in the emergency rooms. We've been exploring memories of how we got from the Sabbath being a delight and an integral part of the spiritual lives of the people in the Bible to where we are today, where Sabbath either does not exist for Christians or has negative connotations. And the first three memories that we have looked at have dealt with memories of justification of the change from Sabbath to Sunday worship. We looked at um, the apostles and or Jesus changed it. We couldn't find any support in the Bible. We looked at the assertion that the Sabbath was only for the Jews and we found evidence in both the Old and New Testaments that it was a universal gift to mankind. We looked at the concept that the Sabbath and the law in general, the Ten Commandments in general, were nailed to the cross and, and ended and that God now has a new standard uh, that uh, he calls his people to live up to. Today we're going to take a different tack and this is a memory that Sabbath keepers have of how the change happened. So, and it, it's usually uh, done, shared as an assertion, the Catholics changed the Sabbath. Uh, and a hundred years ago, that was a very easy assertion to make because the Catholics flat out made that claim. Uh, in their training of new members, they said that the church had, the Catholic church had changed the Sabbath. And newspaper articles, they taunted Protestants with that, with submitting to them for having changed. But I want to go back further than a hundred years ago. Okay, today you don't see those assertions either in the catch uh, the training for new new Catholic members, or in their public statements. Instead, you see the Church felt that it had authority to change the Sabbath. So let's go back, and I want to want to point back to some some other episodes in history uh, to deal with this. About 100 A.D., uh, the Bishop Arrhenius of Antioch. So Antioch was a large city in Syria at the time, uh, and this bishop was being transported to Rome for execution, very similar to uh, Paul's journey. And he wrote letters to some of the churches as he was leaving Turkey uh, and Syria and traveling towards Rome. And in them he spoke in glowing, idealistic terms about the Catholic Church. But it was not a proper noun. He used it as an adjective in Greek, Catholica, from which we get Catholic, meant universal or general. And he was speaking of the church as a whole, the whole church, what was accepted by the whole church. A hundred years later, the situation was very different. Christianity was in chaos with multiple competing sects. There was no New Testament that was agreed upon as being authoritative. And, okay, one of the sects by, uh, led by Marcion uh, developed in Rome, and he maintained that the God of the Old Testament was not the God that Jesus referred to as his father. He said there were two different gods 
and he rejected the entire Old Testament. He was actually the first person to come up with a list of accepted authoritative works that reflected Jesus' teaching. Marcion taught that the apostles had misunderstood Jesus and that uh, even the Gospels that we're familiar with today were inaccurate. The churches that he founded lasted for over 300 years and were competing with the Catholic churches, the churches that continued to hold on to the teachings that they had inherited from the, the religious leaders that had known the apostles. Another one of the sects led by uh, Valentinus um, was even further afield. Okay? Uh, Valentinus uh, felt very free to share what he claimed were secret oral teachings that had been passed down by the apostles. Okay? They had had these public teachings uh, that had been written down in the Gospels and that Paul had, had written down, but there were secret oral teachings that were only passed down to initiates, to the inner circle. This was part of the pattern that was called Gnosticism, secret knowledge. And Valentinus actually produced other Gospels that uh, supported these secret teachings that he was introducing. In the face of all of this chaos, and these were just two examples of the alternate pathways that Christianity was taking, conscientious Christians who wanted to maintain the, the traditional teachings that they had received began to call themselves Catholic. But at this time, there was no central organization of the church. The church was still organized the way we find it in Acts, with bishops and deacons um, and elders in the cities who then oversaw the churches that grew up out in the countryside. So you had these bishops who were the leaders of the church in these metropolitan areas but there was nobody higher than the bishops so you had a regional organization of the church but no organization of the church as a whole and of course egos got involved and Jesus said don't lord it over one another so the bishops were very touchy about other bishops intruding on their turf Nevertheless, by about 200 AD, um, we have records of bishops excommunicating, refusing to worship with other bishops. Excommunicating in that, that era meant something different than it came to mean late in the Middle Ages. It simply meant, I won't worship with you and you can't worship with me and the people who worship with you can't worship in my church and my members won't worship in your churches. Religious coercion and division began to be a part of this attempt of conscientious Christians to maintain a pure faith. jump down to 1000 AD. No, not 1000. Let's go to, to 300, 350. Okay? By now, religious coercion has devolved into physical coercion. Um, Christians were fighting amongst themselves. They were still on the fringes of society. They had no political power. But when it came time to replace a bishop, when, when a bishop died and, and they, the, the metropolitan areas were selecting who would replace them, riots would develop as people objected to one bishop or another. And Christians were 
attacking each other in the streets. There's even one instance where religious leaders from the countryside around a city in it was Antioch in Syria that we referred to earlier, a thousand religious leaders from the countryside descended on the city, killed the bishop, the deacons and the elders and the deaconesses who worked under him and who were defending him, and any of the members who got in the way killed them all, took over the church, and set up their own bishop and hierarchy. When they went back to the countryside, the townspeople rose up, killed the ones that they had put in power, and put their others in, others in power. It was chaos, okay? And when Constantine stepped in and joined the Christian church, he immediately called a council of the bishops and said, look, we've got to, we've got to calm things down there. I mean, we here in the United States feel, feel like you know, things are unstable. We have riots going on over presidential elections. Oh, terrible. We have riots going on when, when someone get kills, gets killed by a policeman. That was the same type of social instability that conscientious Christians were creating in the Roman Empire. Well, Constantine forced the bishops to create a consensus and to agree with one another, at least superficially, and then he took charge of making sure that the bishops who were replaced, that the bishops towed the line, and if a bishop didn't tow the line with the orthodoxy that he had supervised, then he removed them. All of a sudden, the power of the state, civil power, was used to force uniformity amongst the Christians. And as a part of this, Constantine promoted the idea of the Bishop of Rome, the capital of the empire, as being the first among equals. He was the Bishop of the Bishops. He didn't have any authority, but he had the title and the prestige. So we now made the transition. These conscientious, conservative Christians who are trying to maintain the purity of the truth have gone from trying to persuade each other to using religious coercion, who now have the authority of the state behind them to coerce leaders into towing the line, step forward to 1000 AD. The Roman Empire is long gone. Feudalism is the, the norm throughout uh, Europe. And now we have what we today would consider Catholics who answer to the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, uh, as the final say in all things. And they are instituting crusades, military actions, initially against Islam, but very rapidly they turn the, turn the crusades into a tool for forcing uniformity with, within Christianity. Now the Christians have gone to using planned military action to force compliance. By the time Luther came along and the Reformation got, got going, this was the norm. And after the Reformation, the attempt to reform the Catholic Church, made by conscientious conservative Christians trying to maintain t the purity of the, the, the truth, there was war in Europe. We had the Thirty Years' War in Germany. It killed one-third of the population of, Ger of G Germany. Now, there wasn't of the German, German areas, okay? And this wasn't the Catholics coming in and invading. This was the Catholics and the Protestants fighting each other. And the, both were killing each other's members, trying to force 
uniformity. In France, you had the Waldensian Wars, where the French government went to war in the name of the Catholic Church to eradicate a, a sect, the Waldensians, living up in the mountains uh, between France and Italy. England had its civil wars. When the Protestants were dominant, they burned Catholic priests at the stake. When the Catholics were dominant, they burned Protestant priests at the stake. There was no difference in the tools that the conscientious Christians on both sides of the divide used to try to force uniformity. Where was the Sabbath in all of this? Well, it's kind of mixed in with all of these other divisions. When do you celebrate Easter? Do you use icons in the church? Do you venerate saints? Do you, all of these divisions uh, of teaching and practice, and the Sabbath is mixed in with all of these. Here in the United States, 100 years ago, there was a strong push to restore Sunday keeping as Sabbath keeping. And every state had laws on the books mandating the closure of all stores on Sundays, mandating that you not work on Sundays. The mother church that I used to attend in Noble, Illinois, in the early 1900s, every adult male, they were all farmers, every adult male was put into prison and charged with Sunday breaking because people testified that they had seen them working in their fields on Sunday. That case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court before the law was deemed unconstitutional and they were freed. It took over a year of them being in jail before they were allowed to go back to their homes. But Sabbath keepers really don't have a leg to stand on here because I've lived in Sabbath in communities where Sabbath keepers were the majority, and they pass laws for closing all stores on Saturday with fines and penalties. They didn't put people in prison. So how did we get from Sabbath as a delight? to where we are today? Did the Catholics change it? Well, the changes started occurring long before the Catholic Church existed. They did a lot to perpetuate it, but so did the Protestants. Paul said, let every man be convinced in his own mind. Jesus said, don't lord it over each other. This is a hard memory for me to digest because it comes down to my personal practice and how I deal with other Christians, more than that, other people, non-Christians. when there are differences in our spiritual values, our spiritual practices. Do I use spiritual coercion to try to force their compliance with what I believe is true? Am I okay with using secular power to force compliance and behavior. Would I kill another person because they didn't believe the way I did? 
or they worshipped God in a way I don't. On the face of it, at the superficial level, my immediate reaction is no. But when I look at the, the domains where I have authority, my family, my workplace to a degree, within the congregation that I worship in, it's very easy for conscientious commitment to truth to slide into coercion. And that's really my point today. This is a warning to me. Coercion was used to, to force the transition from Saturday to Sunday and to maintain it. But it can just as easily be used to force compliance with any other persuasion or belief or practice. And when it comes to COVID, the same thing is true outside of the spiritual domain. Back in November and December of, 19, of 2020, the Democrats were promoting vaccine hesitancy watch the presidential debates and you find uh, Democrat candidates saying, I would never let them jab that in my arm. Now they cloaked that and there's not scientific evidence that it's safe. They accused President Trump of rushing through the process of developing the vaccine. But within two weeks, of the change in regime in Washington, all of a sudden the evidence was there that the vaccine was safe and now we switched from I would never have it to you have to have it. And now we're using the force of the state to attempt to force uniformity and the Republicans who were promoting vaccines before the election are now it's a crazy world, okay? But both sides are using the same tools. Persuasion, economic, social, coercion. Am I falling into that same trap? And if so, why? So I'm leaving you with a lot of questions today. I'm not giving you a nice, happy story, okay? Um, <laughs> Vivian and I play a game almost every meal, okay? Um, we got married young, and there are some in our family who like to say that most people grow up and get married, but Steve and Vivian married and grew up. But Vivian's quick to point out that Steve hasn't really grown up yet. And those of you who are my intimate friends uh, sometimes agree with them. So there's this game that we play every, almost every meal, now that it, we're just a twosome and we're on a perpetual eternal date. And um, I find myself again and again, I'll watch how she's playing and I'll see her make a mistake a strategic error and oh, I'm over here gloating and planning how I'm going to exploit exploit it and then I discovered that I have made the exact same strategic error myself while I was gloating over hers I want to suggest it's very easy to do that in the spiritual realm as well it's very easy for us to become preoccupied with the mistakes, the errors that we find in other people's lives and be blinded to the fact that we're making the exact same mistake in our own. 
So the Sabbath is a delight for me. Sabbath is a day of rest, spiritual rejuvenation, disengagement from the economy and the conflict with the values of the society around me, around me that I find myself in. I focus on the spiritual elements of life exclusively. And that's really what I'm inviting you to explore. Okay. It creates a richness to my spiritual life that would not be there if if I didn't have Sabbath. So be safe, my friends. Please continue to be prudent. And I look forward to joining you again next week.